Welcome to Pause for Thought with me, Greg. Well, over the last weeks, we've been looking at the names and characteristics and uh, attributes of God and of Jesus and the unity of the Old Testament and the New Testament and that how one without the other is incomplete. Then I was thinking about how it's possible for us as mere humans who have a sinful nature, which we talked about yesterday, how we can follow the Lord at all. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked, who can know it? And then I was drawn to think about King David and how Jesus was descended through Mary and through earthly surrogate father Joseph to King David, the line of David. And I was reminded of the scripture which says that God says that God loved King David because he was a man after his own heart with integrity, who meted out justice and did what God asked. But then I was reminded that King David wasn't perfect. Neither was Moses perfect. But even after a struggle, Moses did what God wanted, saying, you know, I can't speak, I, you know, I stutter. And the thing that stands out most of all is the time when King David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Remember that he was at home. He should have been at, uh, with the army fighting the battle at the front. But he decided to stay home and idle hands. And he saw Bathsheba bathing on her roof and he lusted after her. And then he hatched a plan to put her husband at the front of the uh, battle so that he would be killed. And then he lived in denial after he committed this adulterous act. And then Nathan the prophet came to see him and confronted him, not mentioning that it was him, but speaking the whole story. And he said, who is this? man going to punish him and Nathan said it's you and of course Bathsheba was pregnant with King David's child and one of the things that happened as a result of this adultery was that God withdrew his hand and unfortunately the baby died So how on earth, or in heaven, <laughs> can King David be a man after God's own heart? He started off as a shepherd boy, was anointed against all the odds with all his brothers. So he'd obviously spent a lot of time on his own in the hills looking after the sheep. He was a servant of King Saul, the first Jewish king. He then started to lead battles and people started singing, oh, David's greater than King Saul because King Saul kills his dozens, but King uh, David kills his thousands. And Saul eventually saw that God was with David and became jealous and ultimately an enemy. But the difference is, that King David had a heart to seek God. We see this throughout his songs, his poetry, in Psalms. And we see it when he realizes he's sinned against God, what happens. And 
Psalm 51 is a great example of this. This is what he says after Nathan had gone and confronted him. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He committed adultery and he perpetrated murder. Then he goes on, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. So you can see from the, these first few verses that he recognizes his sin. It's before him day and night because he can't get away from it, even though he tries to hide it. And then he recognizes that only God can forgive him. And that whatever God says and does is justified. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Then he reflects on the state of man. Surely I was sinful at birth from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb and you taught me wisdom in that secret place. And one of the things I keep saying is that we need to keep a short account. Repent often. Say we're sorry often. But this is a cry from the heart. This is not just words. And he's reflecting on how right from the very beginning God was with him. And he learned so much being alone with God and prayerfully and playing his harp and writing songs. Then he goes on, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And we also know that sin can only be forgiven and cleansed by deep repentance. And repentance is not just saying, oh, I'm sorry. It's actually a broken heart over sin. So much so that you turn around 180 degrees and don't do it again. He goes on, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me, this is a beautiful part, a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And this reflects what it says elsewhere in scripture when it says that the Lord will exchange our heart of stone for a heart of flesh. A pure heart with a steadfast spirit. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. He also recognizes that he was anointed as king. And that doesn't just mean that he was anointed with oil. He was. But that the Lord gave him the privilege of the Holy Spirit in his life to guide him and strengthen him. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He understood what he could lose. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And sometimes the Lord asks us to do things which are a challenge and difficult and sometimes we don't wanna do it. It's like having a teachable spirit where we put aside all the things of ourselves 
to learn something new that will bring us to change. Then after all this, he says, when this is all done, I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my saviour, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. So what he's saying is, if you forgive me, I'm not going to keep it quiet as a secret. I'm going to teach others what is the right way to live and walk. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. And although he is deserving of judgment, and God's judgment is right, and the sin weighs heavy on him, and he realizes what he can lose, he wants to restore or be willing for God to restore that relationship with him that he had when the Lord taught him wisdom in the secret place. Then he goes on, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. And unfortunately, in this day and age, with the prosperity gospel and those big televangelists, they say, if you sow a seed of so many thousand dollars or hundred dollars or whatever, God will bless you and you'll get your Mercedes and you'll get your new house and your new job and health and all the other things. But here, David saying, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You know, and later we know that he stored up all the materials and all the necessary resources to build the temple so he was willing to give it all but he says what i do bring my sacrifice O oh god is a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart you you o oh lord my god will not despise a broken and contrite heart teachable willing for the Lord to transform it. Then he finishes by stating that he knows that he's anointed not for his own personal self, not for his enrichment, but for Israel. And after all this, he says, may it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous. Because the only way we can be put right with God is through coming to him with a humble, obedient, broken and contrite heart. Remember we were talking about how Jesus came humble and gentle as king into Jerusalem on a donkey. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will give us a humble, broken and contrite spirit. That we may come into your presence with adoration and praise and worship. Because we know that when we come with this broken and contrite spirit and heart, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin even though you are right in your verdict and justify when you judge, because we are sinful, even from our mother's womb. We pray that we will learn the lessons and be teachable 
We pray that we will spend time in the secret place where you can teach us wisdom and knowledge and understanding and discernment. We pray that you bless us and guide us through your Holy Spirit in our hearts. And we pray as you forgive our sins, where they are as red as scarlet, they'll be white as snow, that you will heal our land. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue to pray for Lindsay. Janet B and Philip, who's recovering well after his hip operation. Peter, Mark, Rick, Liz, Richard, the two Johns, Mick and Mary, Mary in Weston, Jim in Scotland, Dave, pray for his kidneys, and Alan for his leg and knees. for Chris's mum. We pray for Tony and his partner, Sandra. And as you may know that we've been praying for Dot and for Dennis. Unfortunately, they have now passed. But after all the dementia and suffering, the family can see that it is a happy release. But it's still difficult, it's still painful, still a challenge. So we pray for Janet and Glyn and his sister Susan and all their family, that the Lord will be with them through this difficult and challenging time bringing comfort, bringing strength. And we thank you, Lord, that their suffering has ended. And we pray, Lord, for healing in body, mind and spirit, for your direction, for your comfort, for your peace, for your strengthening that they may run and not be weary, walk and not faint, but rise upon wings like eagles, healed and made whole, comforted with your presence day by day. And we ask this all in the name and to the glory of our Saviour Jesus, who is our King, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you, all whom you love, cherish, and pray for this day and forevermore. Amen. So until next time, it's a big God bless you from me, Greg. Bye.